Welcome to the Saturday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 355. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is December 16, 2017, Beethoven's birthday. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We're just full of knowledge we don't realize. And Alan, welcome back to the program. A lot of everybody knows that if we're going to talk with Alan, it's going to be some good legal discussion uh, about a great topic. And I, I asked Alan, hey, you want to talk about the cake thing? He goes, yeah, let's talk about the cake thing. And it's easy to talk to Alan about the cake thing because um, you have been before the Supreme Court. Yes. And you won. Yes. Uh, tell me just briefly about that case. That was a case involving Hawaii's liquor tax. They taxed all liquor coming into Hawaii at 20% of the wholesale value, but they exempted from the tax if it, liquor that was made in Hawaii, like rum and a kolehau and pineapple wine from Maui. And so I said, this isn't right. Uh, you can't discriminate against interstate commerce. And I brought the suit and Hawaii courts saw nothing wrong with it. So I had to go up to the U.S. Supreme Court and they said, no, won't fly. You can't use the Your 21st Amendment is supposed to prohibit liquor altogether not to allow you to favor the consumption of local made liquor so well, congratulations yeah. so it can be done you can take a case and reason before the the judges and say this is an error this is outside the constitution um our rights are being violated and in <clears throat> as such uh we have a baker in colorado who was approached by uh, two men who wanted to get married and said, bake us a cake. Um, right. he, he said, yeah. They had I, been customers, long, long time customers. Yeah, I mean, he's never refused them for being a uh, same sex partnered couple. Um, he said, listen, you can have cakes here, but I can't bake a cake specifically for your wedding. Now, I am a small business owner. I understand that there's reasonable limitations that the government puts on me in order to operate within commerce um, and I you know I stick with those mm -hmm. because I want to make money uh, now as a Christian business owner I follow the laws I don't take kickbacks I don't work heavy margin well, <laughs> well that's a for a reason I suppose and so um, but I understand I have to limit and curtail some of my not beliefs but practices because I operate within uh, the state of Connecticut and the United States government mm -hmm. that's kind of the argument that they want to make listen there's uh, we have severe anti-discrimination laws in uh, Colorado we're gonna uh, take you up on that uh, anti-discrimination law because we think you're discriminating against us well uh, the interesting thing is that of course you don't read about this much in the council of the case but at the time that they wanted this cake made for them uh, it was not legal in Colorado to have same-sex weddings so they were gonna take this cake out of state to some other place where they could have their wedding I guess but uh, they wanted him to bake it in Colorado and they wanted him to show that he supported their their marriage and he just said, sorry, can't do that. And so they, you know, they could have gone, got, they certainly could have gotten a wedding cake in the, whatever state they were going to get married in. It might have been a little fresher. And, um, but no, they, they were going for this for an agenda that they wanted to shut him down after that. And that's what too often, so uh, what we see by the people that are in the most extreme end of these activists, they want to make not only a point for themselves and say, look at us, we, we're the first ones doing this, first ones doing that, but you dare oppose us and we're going to put you out of business. And that's the, um, the, it's the backlash that I don't like and the attempt to use the law to punish people for, again, simply having honest religious beliefs. Well, and I think that's what may have sunk the, uh, the case at the Supreme Court level, too. I, I was reading about the oral arguments. I, we can get to that. <clears throat> that's all right. Well, let's try and fix this on the fly. Your, your camera fl froze again. I don't know if you click oh. it or whatever you want, but let's let's fix it on the f on the fly. Okay. Now we find ourselves in this position because of uh, Justice Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, how did we get same sex marriage, Justice Kennedy? You know, mm -hmm. you can just go back the last you know eight years. How did that happen, Justice Kennedy? Yeah. Justice Kennedy, Kennedy. <laughs> you know, hey, Kennedy. Yeah. Right. And so right. he's also the one who said. Um, 
during the Oreo arguments, and don't ask me why I listened to these, uh, but I did, he was uh, a little upset at the uh, people who wrote the law and had the board uh, for discrimination right. in Colorado because they were all extreme liberals and hated uh, um, heterosexual marriage. Yeah, well, they thought that this religious belief was just bigotry. Mm -hmm. And they, they said that in the course of the hearing, that uh, if you believe, sincerely believe this is religion, then you're a bigot. He asked so, them to take that back, on the record. Yeah. Wow. And, well, <laughs> he said that, uh, you know, this is what I warned against, or what we warned against when I gave Obergefell. There are a lot of sincere people who truly and religiously believe that there's no such thing as same-sex marriage and it's not bigotry it's it's a pre-exercise of religion so that may have that was a turning point i think in the oral argument um because he up to that point seemed to be leaning toward going with the um the government and finding the cake maker but uh, after that i think he came to realize that no you know we can't go this far in this particular instance and the whole thing has to do of course the argument that uh, the baker is discriminating has to do with the fact that he's looks at the product. Uh, he's just selling food, and if we go into restaurants these days, you know they can't discriminate against us on the ground that we're same sex or anything like that. But it totally ignores the artistic element of a wedding cake. A wedding cake is a unique creation. It's not just a cake you just go down to the market and buy one. Now, otherwise, they could have done that. No, they came to this business masterpiece cake works because they wanted a masterpiece and they wanted a unique creation and so they're invoking the artistic side of things they're invoking his artistic capabilities and you could say uh, would it be right to um, make a um, hold an atheist painter if he didn't want to uh, paint the Sistine Chapel would it make would it be right to hold him responsible for discriminating like that because he doesn't want to do anything re for religious people and obviously you can't do that and so the question is can the government force someone to exercise his art just because he's in the business of being an art artist artist of some kind well and, you mentioned today is the birthday of beethoven this is also the date that the bill of uh, rights was signed uh -huh. the amendment to our constitution finally ratified and yeah. finally ratified um mm -hmm. clearly the forefathers knew that there was going to be issues uh, with press, with religion, uh, Second Amendment, yay, uh, all these other things. And so the, they set out and said, these rights are kind of special. Mm -hmm. um, do we still have a special right to religion, a freedom of religion anymore, where we can say, you know, I'm doing this out of the bounty of my belief and expression. Um, you can't claim that, and I, 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 you can't make me give it to you. Yeah. There are two aspects to the freedom, so-called freedom of religion in the First Amendment. First is freedom uh, in the sense of no establishment of a state religion. So the state can't set up one religion over above all the others, the way it has done, in fact, with the Episcopal Church and allowed it to make a trust on everybody's property, but that's another day. Um, so there's established, no establishment of a religion by the state. And the second is no Im infringement of your right to exercise your religion. Uh, again, unless, and what started this down this little slippery slope was a 1990 uh, case, I think it was, from Oregon, where the Indians, remember, wanted to smoke their peyote as part of their uh, religious rites. Yes. And, and uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, held that, no, it had to yield, their practice in that case had to yield to a general prohibition against peyotes, uh, apple to everyone everywhere in Oregon. And it wasn't intended to infringe their religion, so they just have to live with it. If they want to practice their religion, they need to go to another state. But um, it wasn't intended specifically to snuff out their religion. It just was to ban peyote. And so uh, once you started doing that, religion, that's what provoked a lot of these religious reformation acts. Uh, the state laws that tried to protect um, people in religion from being discriminated by laws of general application like that. And that started that whole Religious Freedom Res Restoration Act um, movement across the country. And we've now had backlash against that by the, um, again, the gay movement, because they say, no, those laws are really just hiding, protecting bigotry. And so once again, we're going in this circle where is it religion or is it bigotry? Is it religion or is it bigotry? One man's fish is another man's poison. And you just have uh, another kind of um, 
debate that you can can't really establish principles because they don't agree on definitions. Uh, Aristotle taught us that unless you agree on definition, logical argument is impossible. So they're arguing religion means one thing, and we're saying religion means another thing. And there's never going to be an agreement until they come to sit down at the table and say, okay, now let's, what are we talking about here? Well, and ba define it. based on my definition, which is probably the correct one, um, <laughs> I, I take both sides of the religious clause because uh, they are favoring the pagan religion over the Christian religion. Uh, because right. my definition of same-sex marriage would fall under paganism, uh, and so, and then I don't get to express under the second one. So I can see that, but um, what laws can we expect that the federal government, the state government, can have over commerce? Well, and this is—I was going to say that it's almost like a there's a third freedom that has been taking over and um, sort of eliminating the first two that we talked about, freedom of exercise and freedom from establishment. It's called freedom from religion. Mm -hmm. And that is the idea that I'm offended by religion. I don't want to have anything, it can't have anything to do with me. It can't you know, regulate my business. It can't regulate how I feel. It can't regulate when I get up or when I go to sleep. And so therefore, I want to have a, a world that's. I don't want to have any prayers in my presence. I don't want to have any uh, assemblies asking for God's blessing. I don't even want the, the "In God We Trust" on the on the dollar. And uh, so this movement. I don't think God like wants that. "In God We Trust" on the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't asked him. I don't think. <laughs> the, um, but the point is, as I say, it's kind of like a, that's a, a new. Um, a new angle on our freedoms and it's taken over and it's not in the Constitution. We were a religious nation founded under God as it says in the Pledge of Allegiance um, and you can't deny that fact and when you start denying it and saying oh it, it, you, there's this freedom from religion you're rewriting the Constitution you're undermining the basic core values of this country so I'm sorry I can't go there I'm a Christian lawyer just like you're a Christian businessman and I cannot, uh, I would never take a case that asked me, for example, to uh, get the motto struck from the dollar bill or get the uh, Pledge of Allegiance changed because I just think it denies how this country got started. So there's limits and we've got to recognize there's limits and you can't just have it your way because this is the me too generation, the me, everything's about me, everything's about why, what do I practice and what do I think, look at me selfie here and this kind of thing. That's a whole new attitude that we've developed in the last two generations. You imagine talk, trying to explain to your grandmother what a selfie was. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, now even back in my grandma's day, great grandma's day. I'll, I'm going to go on generation back. You know, in, okay. the, in pictures in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, all the way to about 1930, people didn't smile for pictures. Yeah. You know, mostly because they don't like to show their teeth because dental yeah. hygiene back then wasn't what it is today. They didn't have that conspiracy fluoride in the water. Um, yeah, things have really changed. But and I, I saw a picture the other day of a baseball audience in the 1950s. The men all had hats, ties, and coats in the, in the audience of the baseball game. <laughs> the women wore long dresses. And, <laughs> and this hats. is before deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But... I want to uh, put a little hope in the Supreme Court as well. They recently had a, uh, a case that came before them about hate speech. Um, can we curtail speech? Uh, is there some speech that we, you know, uh, need to, uh, as a court, uh, condemn and not allow in the realm of hate? And surprisingly, they said no. We're not. We're not going there. And yeah. that kind of gives me hope. Even you know. Not all of them voted for it, but <laughs> right. it was, I think, eight to two, seven to two. Oh. Yeah. Again, that's the, the idea that you can't be forced to say something that you just uh, don't believe in. So just like you can't stop somebody else from saying what they believe in, so you can't be forced to say something that you don't believe in. So the government can't tell you, for example, put this message on the cake. We love gay marriage. Uh, and if you don't put that message on the cake, we're going to fine you and put you out of business. The government can't do that. It simply can't force people to say things uh, that they don't believe in. 
So that's the contrary to that. And when the Supreme Court ruled this way, it says, you may hate that speech all that you like, but the point is, this is a marketplace of ideas. It won't go very far, or if it does go very far, this country's in trouble. But in the marketplace of ideas, that kind of speech dies very quickly. It doesn't gain very many followers. And so you have to let it be for the sake of freedom of speech. Otherwise, we don't have free speech if you get in the business of deciding what people can say or not. Now, fire in a crowded theater? Yes, right. Obviously. Okay, that's the classic example of what you can't get and do and get away with, but then some say, oh, it's just free speech. <laughs> no, uh, speech has a purpose, it communicates. And if you're communicating something that is hateful to people, well, then just stop listening to it. Yeah, I heard you can't, the new one is you can't say uh, B-52 at a bingo parlor in Iran. <laughs> it's just, it's weird. Um, yeah, speech is funny that way, but I'm surprised often when I get an email from somebody who watches the program. I'm like, wow, you watch the program? You're a bishop or you're an archbishop. That's really kind of cool. I get lawyers all the time who watch the program because of the stuff you put on. If by chance a member of the Supreme Court were watching, what kind of uh, uh, information should they be looking for, in your opinion, in this type of case? I would say that they should separate, as I say, the idea of what is speech and artistry and communication from what is simple consumption of product, that is generic product that people want to be able to buy at any place of business that sells it without being told, no, sorry, we don't like the way you look, we won't sell to you. So um, they, if they make the dis careful distinction, the First Amendment is all about expression, communication, and particularly artists should cherish the First Amendment. Artists in any profession, and uh, because it's what protects their right to express themselves through their art. And so I think that you have to give that, it's not a turning on religion as such, it's freedom of expression of your ideas and your intellectual uh, capabilities that you have developed and nurtured over the years into where people recognize and come to you and want you to pay you to exercise your artistry on their behalf. So you're not a simple common workman who um, is not offering anything special that particular day. One nail is just like any other nail, so why won't you sell me a nail? And that's that's a different um, thing. And if they make that distinction, I think it can be very clear to solve these things, as I say. It's uh, go back to your Aristotle, go back to your categories and functions. <laughs> Those and are fun. Things. I mean, yeah. that, that was the funnest time I had in college. But yeah. I want to back up. They're also deciding um, whether or not the law in Colorado is constitutional. Um, the discriminatory law? Yeah, well, but, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's really what's before them. Uh, As I know. say, yeah. It's, I would say that it's not the law that's unconstitutional, but it's been unconstitutionally applied okay. in this case in a way that um, defeats the First Amendment. So the First Amendment trumps Colorado law in that case, and that's why we say, yeah, it's not that your law is unconstitutional across the board and it can't ever be administered in any case, but like in the hardware case, selling nails, for example, you can certainly apply it in that case, Yeah, well, but you can't do it here. My daughter, my middle daughter, is a baker. She works at a bakery, okay. and mm -hmm. every Wednesday here at the Carlson household is experiment day. Ah. And, uh, you know, I get some of the most delicious... <clears throat> high sugar content uh, food you could imagine and it's because oh she loves daddy and she's you know it, it, it's obviously not a religious thing but uh, it's an expression she wants to do in its sure. art form for her all the sure. cakes she bakes at the at the bakery she puts out and anybody can buy, come by them um, you know Kevin the first thing I ever learned to make when I was four years old was a cake because I just loved cake yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I got the cookbook down and I got mother to help me and I made my first cake and I've been you know loved to cook ever since but people call us so. twins you know <clears throat> <laughs> I love, yeah I, uh, for me it was uh, pancakes and I wouldn't use syrup I would put ah. sugar down the middle and roll it in <laughs> yeah that went really well <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, we made people hungry. I hope we made them curious about the law. Um, and this is something you need to pray about. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our courts. Um, right. And we hope that uh, sometime. How long does it take for something like this to be decided and, and made official? 
Well, if it's a five to four case, it's likely to stretch out for a while, and it might be not, not be until June when we hear that those decisions. Okay. They tend to let the, the more unanimous ones out sooner, and they keep trading opinions on the other one, trying to persuade one side or the other. Let's stretch. talk inside baseball quick before we sign off. It's yeah. already been decided. Right after they have the hearing, they sit down for dinner or lunch. Right. Uh, tell conference, us how that works. Yeah. yeah, on Fridays they hold the conference, and after the oral argument, I'm sorry, they, they have a conference after, after the oral argument on just that case, and they take a straw vote, and they see what the, how it's leaning, and so then the Chief Justice assigns the opinion on the majority side as to which person is going to write the opinion. And then they go back to their chambers and get their law clerks with busy drafting opinions. And then they trade drafts for weeks, months, swapping back and forth. Justice says, you know, if you put this in, then I'll be, I'll jo join your opinion. Mm -hmm. And if you take this out, I'll join your opinion. And so on, it, the horse trading goes like that. And when they finally have reached a, 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 a staple point when nobody wants, can make any more changes, then they publish the decision. Of all the secrets this nation has ever held, I've never heard of a leaked opinion. No. That's solid. No, that's, when, when they make yeah. their decision, the pages aren't saying nothing. They don't tell nobody. Nope. You know, <laughs> the amazing. only one knows is the, the only one knows is the justices and the printer. Mm -hmm. That's and it. He's, he's, and he's had the contract for so long that he wouldn't dare leak it. <laughs> yeah, right. Alan, thank you for your time. I'm Kevin Coulson. Okay. And I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 355 of Anglican Unscripted.